All right, looks like we are live on both. Woohoo! Hi, right. Chris. Hi, Anna. How are you doing today? Oh, excellent. Super excited to be doing this video with you for all of our customers here at Base Buzz. Um, we've been thinking a lot about how to communicate um, the way to read your report over to our folks. Uh, we've done lots of blogs, we've done lots of emails. I think this is probably the best way for all of us to talk about how to read your base files reports. We've got lots of questions from customers. Um, I can't wait. This is going to be really cool. Well, I think it will as well. You know, we get a lot of really great interest from people about feline breeds, about cats, um, and how, how cat breeds kind of, kind of came to be. Now, we also, I know we've, we've got a, uh, a new blog that came out just today um, that's about how cat breeds became kind of where they are today and just and, and how, really how they developed. It's a great, great piece that, that we can read through and you'll see it in the chat. Um, it'll be posted up in there as well as on our blog. And our website. That's right. That's right. It's a great blog. We know we've been working on that blog for months. Um, mm -hmm. So please take a look and thanks to the to the science team here at Base Buzz that works really, really hard to put those blogs together for you guys. Um, so you know what, Chris? Funny thing, this is my first live with our customers. Isn't that awesome? I'm so excited. A little nervous. <laughs> They're a lot um, of fun. They're a lot of fun. We've got some great customers. I would love to just really quickly introduce myself, um, and then we'll jump right into the blogs and to into the into the reports. Is that okay with you? Um, just so yes. that the customers who know why, why I'm here and why we're talking about this. So yeah, you know, I'd love for you to introduce like how 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 your love for baseballs kind of got you to where, where this company is today. Okay, cool, cool. So a few minutes just about, about me and a little bit about the history of baseballs. So um, I founded this company about three years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. It was founded originally in San Francisco and then we moved the office and the laboratory to Los Angeles, which is where we are right now. Um, the idea originally was um, we, me and, and a bunch of my friends were, are, are huge cat lovers. Um, always looked into what new cool, cool cat stuff is out there. And we were shocked to find out, this was about three and a half years ago, that there were all of these amazing products for dogs, uh, all of these amazing science-driven products for dogs, and there wasn't anything for cats. Mm -hmm. um, we, we wanted, you know, be the change you want to see. We thought, you know, this is really unfair. There's a lot more cats than dogs in the United States. Cats are underfunded in science. They're understudied in general. And so we wanted to change that. So the idea came out of a necessity. Um, and here we are three years later, we have an incredible company. We have thousands and thousands of customers um, and are bringing unique change into the world of feline science. The blog that, you're, that we posted today is just one of the examples. Take a look at all of the interesting new theories and new things that are coming out of our laboratory. Um, this is what Base Plus was all about. And there's no way we could have gotten here without every single sample that comes into our lab. Um, we need more samples to make more discoveries. Um, and so it is all about the pet parents that are buying this product and they're contributing to the science. So huge thank you for all of you guys that are interested in, in cat genetics, um, that are citizen scientists yourselves. Um, so without further ado, let's talk about cat science and let's talk about cat breeds of course of course now we do have some prepared questions kind of people that asked yeah. the ones beforehand um and so while we're going through these if there are any questions that stem off those or any other questions that we don't answer please put them in your zoom chat or in your facebook chat and we'll we'll get to those today yeah we'll try to get to all of them um okay chris i want to start with my favorite question um i actually answer a lot of customer questions this comes up a lot so the question is like this hey baseballs my cat is short haired it's got short hair and you say that that paw breed and the breed report is a long hair breed how is that possible oh that is a very common question and you know it kind of rolls back to a lot of of that old phrase of, of don't judge a book by its cover. Um, the neat thing about genetics is it really helps us take our time to look past that hair coat and into kind of the full genetics that make up a cat. Now, when we start to think about percentages that make up hair coat from genetics, um, particularly for, for hair length, which is a huge determinant for people, a lot of that control is really associated with one single gene. Now, when we think about that in the scope of the entire 
entire genome, that single gene is such a, is a tiny, tiny, tiny minuscule percentage. There's a lot more complicated genetics that go into immune function, um, organ creation, uh, body size, and, and types, and all of these different, almost like hidden things that we don't see in, in how, how an organism really lives and grows. Um, and so what we're really trying to do and what we, we do is when we compare, we don't look just at that singular outside cover, but we look at all of the different parts of the cat and start to compare them in from there. So yeah, so that, that ends up with that huge, sometimes we can see that, whereas we really think about that long hair. It's, it's really a small percentage that, won't, that doesn't affect the breed as much as we think. What, you know, a follow-up to that question is, what happens when the top breed in the breed report um, just simply at all does not look uh, like, like the cat in question? Can you just give us a, a, a quick breakdown of how to read the breed report? What is it, a, how do breed groups work, um, the differences between Western and Eastern? And then how would you answer that question? My cat doesn't look like the top breed. Well, you know, when we start to look at, at breed groups, we kind of have to take the breed groups and then the breeds themselves. That's almost kind of like a two-part question that we have. Um, so what we'll, we'll do first is we'll, we'll look at the breed groups and that percentage breakdown. So now if you, if you all do have your reports out and open, uh, if we go onto that breed report, chain, uh, breed report page, the one that has the chromosome map as well as that kind of circle in the top right corner, um, now that circle is the breakdown of the composition of each of your breed groups. Uh, one thing, I'm going to plug it again, the, the how cat breeds were created starts to give a visual display of how those cat breed groups are related to each other and where they overlap, um, which has some really interesting historical perspectives. Uh, now, when we start to look at the breed group percentage breakdown, this is extremely, this is a great way to see the genes within your cat that are associated with these breed groups. Now, this number does equal 100%. Um, this is kind of where we start to add up where we've got, um, say, a cat that has 30% Western and 12% Eastern um, genes associated within those. And that really helps us with a good determinate breakdown of those 100%. Um, and so that's, that starts to almost where we think about where we know where those genes were starting to come from. Uh, and so when we start to look at the breeds themselves, um, the way that we do those is uh, we take the, the your cat sample DNA and we compare it to all those that are in our pedigree breed group. Um, and so these, these pedigree breeds they themselves are many times common mixtures of both of these things. You know, it's the same thing with, with cat breeds, many of them are extremely young um, and were created from some of the mixed populations themselves. So we have a lot of kind of mixtures and, and genetic averages that we're learning about. Um, I know this is kind of a really kind of long-winded question on there and answer, and I'm sorry about that. But no, it's good. It's really good. Can I just ask, yeah. so when you look at our breed groups and mm -hmm. let's say, um, the, the main breed group in your report, if you have your reports out, um, is Western. Do yeah. you then just say, okay, my cat is mostly Western, and mm -hmm. then you have to dig into the Western group and you see the top one or two breeds, and then you say, well, the closest breed to my cat is in the Western group in the top breeds. Is that how? You yes, that's it? a great way to start to look at it and read about it. You know, the, the main one is when you really find that breed group determinant, that is kind of your big heavy push that helps us understand the, the overall um, heritage and, and potential characteristics and clues in the genetics would be. And so we go from there and then start to compare within that breed group itself. Got it. Got it. Okay. I think that is, that is a very important point and very, very useful. Start with the breed group and then mm -hmm. dig deeper into that particular, the largest breed group, and then look at the top breeds. Yes. Um, Another question that comes up a lot as I talk to customers is many of our customers have been with us for years. Mm -hmm. um, these are our early adopters. They've been amazing in supporting us early on. Those reports change and the breeds in those reports change. The, uh, the top breed can go down, another new breed can come up. Why does that happen? Can you help us explain that? Absolutely. And, you know, I, I, I love this kind of this um, in, in part of our blog for, for how these breeds were created. This map really kind of helps us get a good visual idea of what that means. So I'm going to pull this up and, and share it so that even if you don't have the blog pulled up right now, um, you'll be able to see it. Um, but when we start to look at the breeds themselves, 
they start to become very, very closely related, particularly in the Western breed groups. Uh, what we do over time is we are constantly collecting new samples. So we're constantly collecting uh, more samples from pedigreed breeds, the ones that we don't have on our report, but then also the ones that we do have on our report. Now, the reason we do that is there's a variety of genetic lines that occur within each breed, and each breed evolves over time based off of um, what, what we consider, what's considered the breed definition. Um, now, let's see. Um, oh, my goodness. Get this all done. And um, I love that breed map. I think it is such a useful uh, visual example of how breeds overlap and the relationship between the breeds that we know. Really is. And here we do, we have it right up on the screen. So we can see how, how segmented off the Eastern breed groups are. Um, they are, they don't have as much overlap that we see between these Western breed groups. Um, but if we look within the Western, these are all clustered very closely. Now, as we, add, add, as we add new samples, more and more samples, where specifically they are on this map shifts a little bit on each time. Uh, and so that's, that represents us learning more and more about cats and cat breeds in general. Um, and so as we have the most updated information, we continue to update the report so that you have the most up-to-date information um, and kind of the most cutting in edge information about the breed relativity for your cat. Right, and while those Western uh, clusters are very, very closely clustered together, can you maybe just really quickly explain why that might be? Uh, well, certainly, you know, the, a lot of this rolls back into the, the history and the heritage of each of the breeds. Um, now, um, as we mentioned, a lot of cat breeds are less than about 75 years old, um, particularly those that are coming through this, this kind of Western uh, because of of the development of aesthetic breeding. Now, historically, we think of, of dogs being bred for kind of physiologic differences like hunting or swimming or, or digging, all these different aspects. But whereas cats in these most recent years have only been done for kind of hair coat colors and aesthetic differences. Um, a lot of these have used um, either domestic short hairs um, kind of from that Western gene pool, or they have kind of common ancestors like using American short hairs or Maine Coons to add a specific trait into a new breed. Mm -hmm. And so that leads us to breeds that um, are really just uh, kind of really small segmented breeds that are very close. Um, right. And that we're, we're kind of helping to split the difference and understand what makes this, this breed really that different. And I'll make a point to say here that the reason we're asking for more samples, the reason we're pushing so hard to get this product into the marketplace is that we really want to understand the exact differences between all of these breeds that are so clustered together. And the way for us to do that is to have more samples. Um, with, with more and more samples, base pause and your report will become more and more granular and, and more, um, more true to the cat that you have. Absolutely. Um, you know, yeah. as like you kind of mentioned, each of these breeds has like small different characteristics. And the more we have of each of them and the more we have of customer samples helps us isolate those differences. Um, totally, totally, very clear. Um, very cool, thank you, Chris. I'm gonna switch to a different question, also a question I see all the time and it has to do with percentages. In the base buzz report, there are different types of percentages. And mm -hmm. very often we get asked, well, is my cat, you know, 40% Western, 15% Eastern, 10% exotic, what do these percentages really mean in the base buzz report? And so these percentages are really um, associated, kind of the, the sections that are associated with these breed groups. Um, and so, you know, like when we talk and we see, you know, your cat being 30% Western, that means 30% of your cat's DNA is heavily, heavily associated only with these Western breed groups. It's really not that commonly found within the Eastern breed groups. Um, so the heritage and the origin is expected to be back in that kind of Western or that European cat area on there. Uh, now, from an Eastern standpoint, you know, as we saw, those were much more sectioned off. So um, that is traditionally a smaller section within our, within our cat groups, as we don't have as many who were transported over from Asia into, into kind of the U.S. or haven't tested as many of those. But we can see how, how those are extremely different. And, and so you can see, like, it it's 8%, then you've got a cat that has 8% of these genes that are really just so heavily associated with those of kind of that Asian, South Asia, Southeast Asian origin. Um, so we can start to see how cats may have 
where the genetics may have traveled around the world um, to make your specific unique little fluffy hunter. All, every fluffy is so different. It's so awesome to, to talk about this because, um, you know, you, you wouldn't have this kind of conversation when it comes to dog breeds at all. Dog breeds are so specific. This mm -hmm. is a 100% or 50-50. With cats, it's way more interesting. There's a lot more nuanced ways to understand this. This is why I love what we're doing because before base buzz, almost every cat was a domestic short hair. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden with genetics, you can take a poly cat, you can take a mixed breed cat and you can start identifying where it has come from. You can start identifying the kind of cat it is. You know, mm -hmm. I am, we, we celebrate purebred cats. You know, we talk about purebred cats. I think we need to start celebrating mixed breed cats using the same type of science and the same type of excitement and the same type of breeds as you would when you're talking about purebred cats. So I say celebrate your, your mixed breed kitties. They're as interesting and as exciting and as cute as anyone that is a purebred. Um, so switching topics again, this is a huge topic, comes up a lot, um, and it is specific to a single breed, and that single breed is Siamese. Yes. So the Siamese breed, I'd love to hear from you, like, what is going on with that breed? Why is it, why was it in the base pass report and it isn't anymore? Um, and when is it coming back and why? Well, you know, there's, let's see, we'll start with the very first one. Let's just talk about Siamese in general. Siamese, like understanding what we call Siamese kind of helps us build the foundation for this conversation. So Siamese as a breed, we, we use that term very liberally, um, you know, the Siamese breed, while it being, you know, kind of we have the classic Thai Siamese breed is one of the, the oldest breeds out there. Um, this was so classic and so unique. Um, originally came from, you know, Thailand used to be called Siam, hence the name Siamese. Um, it was brought over to the U.S. in the late 1800s. And we were just really kind of enthralled as a culture with that look and with the personality of that cat. Now, whole color that, point look, right? Whole color point look, that whole yeah. color point look. And then they do, you know, classic Thai Siamese do have a very specific kind of personality, which is, uh, which is so, so nice to have in a home, truly, honestly. Now, at that point in time, we started to, to then mix them in with all of our different breeds that we already had in the Western, like the, the American short hair, or, you know, even some crosses, right. uh, Maine Coons, or just with our domestic short hairs themselves. Um, and so this has kind of resulted in a variety of cats that are called Siamese, that are, are legitimately kind of pedigreed as Siamese cats, but have genetics that kind of vary all over the map, all over the map itself. We were, you know, when we originally started, we were getting some samples that were, were pretty well clustered, but, but not where we expected them to be. If we kind of think back to that map, we'd expect our Thai Siamese, our classic Siamese to be very Eastern. Right. Uh, and, and we weren't getting that, we weren't getting that. Um, so we collected a whole bunch more sample, kind of what we're doing right now and sequencing right now. In fact, they are out towards the lab to, sa to sequence right now and, and we should be getting those results back in the next week or two. Um, we still have to analyze those results, but we've gotten some that have some very specific, we collect a lot of samples with very specific geographic origins. Um, and so we're going to have to basically subset out these Siamese breeds. Um, so we'll see exactly what that data says. I can't speak to anything yet because we don't have it, um, but we're hoping to be able to add it back into our next breed, breed update. Right. Now, that was originally planned for about the end-ish of March, but we've had some uh, coronavirus. I don't know if you've heard <laughs> of that. Uh, we've had some, <laughs> we've <laughs> had some coronavirus slowdown, so that has pushed a lot of our things, uh, you know, a few weeks back and, and delayed us a little bit. So how do you, how would you answer to a cat parent that says, my cat looks like a Siamese, it's got that really beautiful blue color point color into it, and what would you say to that? Would you say there's a chance? Would you say that there's a lot of cats that have color point that are closer to other breeds than the Siamese? What's a good way to explain in a nutshell what to answer to customers that think that they might have a Siamese? Well, it really is going to, you know, the color points are a great, great way to see 
if there is kind of really any Siamese in that background. You know, the color points were very specifically denoted from the Thai Siamese and that original Siamese breed. Um, but since that breed has become so mixed in with the Western breeds, uh, it's still a little bit of a, a, it'll be what one of the things we're really working on is being able to tell if that's more of one that came from this kind of Western American genetic mixture over the last 120 years, 130 years, or has kind of more, let's say, you know, kind of classic lines and kind of more of a recent pullover from, from that Thai Siamese area. And that's what we're really excited to be able to see. Wouldn't be surprised if we have a lot of um, Siamese colored point cats that when we do add back into the report, have a slightly higher percentage of Eastern, but still have a pretty major Western breed group in there. Right. Um, right. great influence, but um, as we mentioned earlier, the coat colors and those sorts of things can actually have a small percentage of those genetic influences on the organism. Genetics is so cool, you know? You can't judge a book by its cover. There's so much more to learn about than just what you can see. There's so many more um, unique ways to characterize a cat than by looking at its color code or looking at its color length. Um, this is such an important point because we're so used to saying, oh, that's a Maine Coon because it's a big cat, or that's a Siamese because it has color point coloring. What we need to start understanding is that there's so much more to identifying a cat and putting it into a category of a breed than mm -hmm. just what you can see. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this is a really good segue into another question that I think is really useful for our pet parents to see. They get our box, they swap their kitty, hopefully they don't lose a digit, uh, they send it back to us, and um, I'm kidding, it's very easy to swap your cat. <laughs> Let me um, say, very easy, no reports yet, it's okay guys. <laughs> <laughs> right, um, and you know, it's kind of a mystery after that, and then in six to nine weeks, voila, you got your report. Can you take us through what happens in those six to nine weeks so that folks can understand all the work that goes into getting you that final report. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You know, you know, once you kind of drop it back into the the mystery that is the post office box, or you know, um, and the magical transportation box there, um, and it shows back up at our lab, uh, then we kind of we have a lot of different steps that that do actually go into it before we can really get back to that breed analysis. You know, one of the the things that we first have to do is always extract that DNA. Um, now that DNA extraction process is um, a really interesting process when we start to think about um, how we pull DNA out um, and how we, we look at it in segments, um, it becomes like say we, we've got a, a more specific breakdown, you know, if you, I mean, we could talk about this for the next three hours if you really want to, <laughs> but, uh, we're going to, we're going to cut this, this into about a minute on here. So uh, we have a great report on our breed report on our eBooks on our website from there, but we extract the DNA. Um, we then then take the DNA and we do what's kind of a, it goes through an amplification um, and library process. So what that means is we then take it, break it down into smaller segments that can be read um, and kind of categorized so that we know where exactly they are. And so if you look on your chromosome map and we have lots of small sections, those are kind of some of the sections that we get uh, categorized or libraried off into. Um, then once that happens, we send it out uh, we, we rather we sequence it from there. We get it all nice and sequenced and get the actual base DNA pairs back, which is really exciting. There's a lot of different ways to do DNA testing. Um, a lot of them only give us kind of like yes or no question answers. But by doing it this way, we get research grade base pair answers um, in which we love and, and really are excited about being able to push forward for our, for our feline. We're research. the only company in the pet space that is doing it like that. Uh, it's a harder way, uh, but ultimately, it's the way that will help us bring uh, innovation and better reporting for all cats. Hopefully, we're going to find unique markers that will help us solve for genetic disease for all cats, not just provide individual reports to cat parents. Absolutely. That's you so know, and, and that's the, you know, when you say all cats, one of the things we always have to bring up is research right now on cats has really been focused on our pedigree breeds. And that's not what we want to do at all. Like by giving it, by providing samples from our mixed breed poly cats, it, it gives us an, an insight into the majority of the cat population that really hasn't been studied yet. And that's why we're so excited. And that's why totally. we're so to be here. Um, uh, 
cool. My goodness, my goodness. All right, we get that back and then we analyze all that and give you your breed report from there. I know there was a lot of steps. I think we got all of them in there. Uh, I think so. I just, you know, <laughs> there's so much that we do. Um, we, we just want you guys to know that the process is very, very thorough. We take this stuff very seriously. We are, we are the, the cat, we are cat people. And so we want to make sure that the reports and the product that you get is the best quality there is. Mm -hmm. um, hey guys, so I have a few questions that have been sent over by our customers. I would love to take a few minutes and dig into those. Chris, if you don't mind, I'll read them out to you and then it's all you to answer. All right, Sound good? Me... <laughs> okay, awesome. So the first question is from Estefania. So she's saying, my cat's percentage for Egyptian Mao, such a cute breed, uh, exotic, is 79%. But exotic as a whole is only 3.48%. Mm -hmm. She's mo mostly polycat, like many cats are, uh, 45%, and Western, uh, 37%. So mm -hmm. how should I interpret such a high percentage or similarity to an Egyptian male? So... There's a lot going on in this question. Um, just to summarize, the, the highest breed group is still the, the Western, but the percentage of um, the Egyptian male has a really high percentage, 79. Yeah. How do you explain that? Well, you know, that, that kind of rolls back to our breed group conversation that we had right, right. at the beginning. Now, when we, we think about breed groups, this is kind of the overall breakdown of the genes that are associated with that breed. So um, as, as Estefani mentioned, um, the exotic as a whole is about 3.48%. Um, so not a very large percentage of that, of that whole map. Now, her highest percentage within that is the Egyptian map, is the Egyptian map. Um, but it still only affects kind of that 3.48%. So even though that's a high percentage, it's kind of, if we think about it, it's a high percentage of a small, of kind of that smaller block. Um, Makes sense. So I wouldn't expect to see, you know, a ton of Egyptian Mao personality or physical traits coming through in this sample. Um, I would expect more coming from all of the, you know, with the Western being um, about 37.35%, I would expect more traits that are associated with the Western type breeds on there. Got it. So to summarize, look at the breed groups first, mm -hmm. find the breed group, which is the highest and yep. dig into that. That's yep. okay. Makes sense. Um, listen, so we, you mentioned this really cool thing that we do called the chromosome map. Um, so the next question is a little bit about the chromosome map. I, before we dig into the question, can you just explain to our, to our pet parents, what is the chromosome map? So we're really excited about the chromosome map um, just to kind of help you visualize. Uh, we're, we're always trying to think of new ways to help you understand and visualize the genetics of your sample. Um, now, you know, with the chromosome map, the way that this works is it helps us break down the um, exact areas and helps us show you the exact areas that are associated with the different breed groups. So these are all the different color coded. So all of these uh, Western, so in Estefani cases, in Estefani's case, the 37.35% of Western will see which make, what, what makes those up in our breed, on our chromosome map itself. Um, so yeah, that's, that's why we, we want you to be able to see exactly where we went through and looked and delineated each point of breed group association on this and color coded it for you from there. Now, Very cool. we did mention the polycat, and so for those that don't understand or haven't, haven't heard this before, polycat... Poly Polycat, we love this. We love our polycats. Um, polycats are mixed breed cats. Now, we don't like the term domestic short hair, domestic long hair, because that, that long hair differentiation is so small, we can't right. tell a genetic difference. Um, and that's why we use the term polycat. It's for all of these um, areas that are still unknown of an association standpoint or unknown historical standpoint. And we one of our goals is to help get that polycat percentage down over time as we learn more and more about each of the breeds and geographic regions. Absolutely. That is one of the biggest goals for us is to find out as much as we can about cat genetics for every breed so that the idea of a polycat, you know, shrinks more and more so that in your, and over the years, this is the plan for base buzz. We want to get the polycap percentage in your reports smaller and smaller so that we can identify the breeds that are associated with your cat um, in, in a more, in, in a better way. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in some ways, you know, I, 
I think there's a lot of things that come up again and again and again in the breed reports. Um, I think you've answered a lot of those questions. Uh, we have a few minutes and I would just love to take a, a, a little bit of time and talk about the health portion of our report. Um, uh, the health portion of our report uh, was launched about nine months ago. Um, it took us a long time to add all of the health markers. We're very, very, very careful about how we test for them. Um, there are markers out there in literature that we have not added to our report. Some of them because we don't think that the, the science is really there yet. Um, so the markers that we have added, uh, we stand behind. Chris, would you give us an overview of how the health report works and what it tests for? Yeah, sure thing. So in the, in the current phase of the health, health report, we've got 38 health markers that represent relations to 16 different diseases. Um, now, the way that these health markers work, um, when we think about um, breeds, how we talked about how breeds evolve over time, health markers are very specific conditions. These, these don't change over time. So we won't expect to see these um, results to change. Um, you know, once we've got a result, then, then that's how we, then that's interpreted and, and gone from there. Now, the way to, to understand the report, there's kind of a few different differentiations. Um, and really the ones that we want to look at are, you know, the, the ones that come across are clear. Typically when we look at a report, we're looking, or when we look at a health marker, we look to see how many copies of a dangerous mutation your cat's DNA has. Now it can have up to two, you know, there's two chromosomes, one from the mother, one from the father. Um, and so we'll have up to two. And if it's clear, means you're clear for the, the uh, marker. Um, a carrier means that your cat won't get the disease, but can pass it on to offspring. Now, for a lot of our customers, this isn't as important when we've got spayed and neutered. Um, but for those that are breeders or, or looking on there, we really want to make sure we don't pass on these genetic diseases. Um, and then we also have those that are kind of at very high risk that, that test positive for a disease. Now, if you, if you have kind of tested positive for a disease, uh, I know we've got a couple questions about specific diseases themselves. Um, we'll get back to you. We, you know, we won't go through all of the diseases right now. Um, uh, and we'll but the question that comes up a lot around disease and a kind of breed too is that many of us have uh, multiple cats at home mm -hmm. um, and many of us have siblings or litter mates. And we get this question a lot. Should I just test one of the litter mates? Um, can you test my two cats to see if they are litter mates or if they are related? Um, can you talk about what it means to do DNA testing for cats um, that might or may not be related? Uh, well, so from a relatedness standpoint, that's a little different than our health markers. Um, you know, so for relatedness that we kind of think of the classic terms in humans like, uh, like paternity testing. Um, and so that, that's kind of that same level of relatedness testing um, that we, we uh, that you have to do to be able to tell if a cat is a sibling or if a, a parent from there. Now, we are working on getting that product up. Um, we expect to see um, relatedness testing available in, in this summer, um, though, of course, uh, timelines are a little shifty right now. <laughs> timelines are a little shifty right now, and so I, I, hate saying, I hate saying dates out loud, even if it is the word summer. Um, but we're, we're working on getting that as fast as we can because it's so important for, um, for breeders and then also, you know, to try and be able to connect um, potential litter mates or, or understand some history of, of these kind of two straight cats you may have found that are together. Um, with, for health markers, so if, if I have litter mates, mm -hmm. do I have to test both of them to find out if uh, the breed, to find out their breed and to find out their health markers? Or can I just do one test for both of the cats? Well, it's definitely recommended that you do one for each of them. Now, the reason that, that this is, is, you know, we start to think about genetics, we get half from a mother and half from a father. Uh, when they start to inherit, this kind of goes back when this original half of the chromosome is made, either in the mother or the father, um, a lot of what's called random assortment occurs. And so that means that you don't get um, two kittens that are exactly the same. We, of course, know this, that there's litter, litter mates that are, have vastly different colors, um, vastly different coat patterns and sizes and personalities. Um, and that can, a lot of be done, it can happen due to this random assortment. So if we do have litter mates tested, uh, one, if we kind of think about them from a health marker term, uh, they are more likely to have similar results on that health marker because they are very small, specific sections we're testing for. But if we think about it on a breed term, from a breed relativity standpoint, uh, we can see a lot of variation. 
Now we don't see a ton of variation in breed groups. You know, this is sure. a lot more similar for our kittens. They will usually be a percentage or two percent um, change within that breed group composition. But the breeds themselves, that relativity themselves within the breed groups can vary a lot depending on the specific sections that each kitten inherited from the parents. That, that makes sense. And I would also add that sometimes you can have different fathers in a single litter. Absolutely. So that is, I, you know, that's a great way to say as well. That's, yeah. um, so it, it definitely makes sense uh, to test both. I agree. Uh, I cannot wait for this new feature, this, this feature of relativity. Um, you will be able to see if multiple cats in your household, um, or even if there's cats in the neighborhood that are part of our base pause database might be related to your kitty. Um, you know, we might even get like some celebrity cats. Like imagine we'll get the sample of Taylor Swift's cat and you can see if you're related to Taylor Swift's cat. That'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that would, that would, you know, there are some great celebrity cats out there that really help push and, and show. So. It, it, there's just so much that you can do with genetics. Um, it's, it's really useful that base buzz, um, the, you know, our team is small, but the majority of our team is scientists and work on the product and are working on these new interesting features that we're rolling out. So you, base boss cat parent, this is just the beginning. The things that we will be adding to our report new features, new ways to understand your cat. Um, there's, I think this is one of the most unique things you can do for this, this, this animal, this thing that lives in your house, it eats your food, it sleeps in your bed, it plays with your kids and you don't know much about it. All of a sudden, genetics bursts open a door. You can find out a bunch of really cool new stuff. Um, so we're coming to the end of our, um, of our live here. We've got lots of really great content. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, is there anything else, Chris, that you want to add or comment on? Anything else that you think we've missed? Uh, well, let's see. Um, health markers. The one thing I do want to say about health markers is they're very specific. So they test for their oh. very specific diseases. Um, and so, you know, for we, we can only say that, that when you're clear for these, that you're clear for this specific disease. Um, there's still a lot of things that can happen to a cat. But this peace of mind and this understanding about diseases really helps us plan for the future, um, particularly those that, that may be affected by those. Um, so uh, we are still working. To, we're always looking at the new literature and all the literature that's coming out. And we, again, are looking to add more health and physical trait markers. So be prepared for those. Again, this is kind of in that same summerish relatedness timeline um, as we further develop the report and, and help you learn more about the not only just the health markers, but the physical traits that make up your cat's coat and hair color as well. Um, and you know, in this new reality, health and wellness is really such, so important, both for yourself, but also for your pet. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm really proud of all of us that are in, this, in the health space for animals, um, trying to understand our pets and trying to make them healthier. Um, mm -hmm. So we have a few more questions coming in. Um, do you think, Chris, that we can answer them right now, or do you think we should, uh, there's, the questions are very, very specific, so how about this, we'll take, uh, we'll take those questions, we'll just reply to them, and we'll share the answers on our Facebook page as well. Yeah, yeah, so Lindsay and Glenn, um, as well as Katarina, keep an eye out for those answers, we, yeah. like say they are very specific, um, and we'll show you exactly, kind of talk you through those specific examples from there. Sounds good. Sounds good. Chris, you've been awesome. Thank you so much for sharing all this knowledge. I think this is a really, really useful um, thing that we did and we're going to share it everywhere. <laughs> Perfect. And if anyone else does like say, if you all have more questions, you can always um, reach me um, at through cure at baseballs.com for some more question answers and we'll be happy to get there. For those yeah. Dr. Chris, you're the best. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Have a good one, Anna. Okay. You too, Chris. Goodbye, Bye. Everyone.